Good afternoon. On behalf of the Homer S. Brown Division and the Women in the Law Division of the Allegheny County Bar Association, welcome to Pathways to the Bench, the Diverse Perspective of Black Women. I am Regina Wilson, Chair of the Homer S. Brown Division and today's moderator. Our panelists have a great deal to share and discuss, so I'm gonna keep the introductions very brief. We could spend the entire hour just talking about their accomplishments. Our first panelist, the Honorable Cheryl Lynn Allen, is the first Black woman to be elected to the Superior Court of Pennsylvania. Judge Allen served on the Allegheny County Court of Common Pleas from 1990 to 2008. She was elected to the Superior Court in 2007 and served from 2008 to 2015. Our next panelist is the Honorable Kim Berkeley Clark. Judge Clark serves as the President Judge of the 5th Judicial District of Pennsylvania. She is the first Black person to serve in this position. Judge Clark was appointed to the Allegheny County Court of Common Pleas by Governor Ridge in 1999 and was elected to the bench the same year. She serves as a judge in the Family Division and primarily hears juvenile court cases. Next, we have Amanda Green Hawkins, Amanda is the Director of the Civil Rights and Human Rights Department and Assistant General Counsel with the Steelworkers Union. Amanda is a candidate for the Commonwealth Court of Pennsylvania and is a past candidate for the Superior Court of Pennsylvania. Our final panelist is Nicola Henry Taylor. Nicola currently serves as the Secretary of the Allegheny County Bar Association. She is the Director of Diversity at Duquesne University School of Law in addition to maintaining a private legal practice. Nicola is a candidate for the Allegheny County Court of Common Pleas. If you have questions during today's program, we ask that you enter the question into the chat box. If there is time at the end, we will try to answer some of them. While planning this program, each one of our panelists discussed the importance of judicial elections. Every court has an impact on the lives of Pennsylvanians. So it is important that we pay attention and vote during judicial, election, judicial elections. Judge Clark, would you like to talk more about that? Um, yes. So what I would like to say is that I sort of get a little perturbed when folks do not take the judicial elections seriously. Um, and maybe perhaps as Judge Allen said before we started, just even the local elections, folks tend to think that they need to vote in the presidential election and that's the most important thing. But when you think about how the judiciary touches the lives of citizens, if you really think about it, you can understand the importance. And that includes the magisterial district courts as well, uh, where a lot of people have encounters. So this, uh, the MDJs affect uh, a lot of people that have limited income and landlord tenant uh, actions, protection from abuse. Um, but when you look at even the Court of Common Pleas, the things that judges can do, they can issue orders for protection from abuse, they can evict people from their housing, they can remove children and terminate parental rights, they can uh, order the death penalty in cases, they can incarcerate people, uh, they can issue warrants. All of these things are very important. And then the monetary things, they can take money and make people pay damages and uh, compensation to people that have had wrongs. Um, and people can receive good results from courts and have uh, justice done, hopefully. But the judiciary is very, very important. And I think that more people need to understand that. I think we've had a lot of focus on it uh, with the federal appointments uh, that have occurred during the last four years. But um, people really need to focus in on the importance of the judiciary and vote. If I may add to that, um, presidents come and go. <laughs> they are elected every four years. Senator, right. Congress, congressmen and women, their Congress people are elected every two years, senators every four years. But when you elect a judge or appoint a judge on the federal level, you're pretty much electing that person for life. Because even though we have retention, we serve 10 year terms in Pennsylvania, which is a long time in and of itself, um, rarely does a judge lose a retention election. So when you elect a judge, you are placing a tremendous amount of power 
into an individual's hands. And power in the hands of people who do not have integrity, um, who are not committed uh, to upholding the constitution and the upholding the law is a very dangerous thing. So people should take judicial elections very seriously. They should, and most people don't really seem to care until they have a result that they don't like before the court or they have a bad experience uh, before a judge. And then that's when they become concerned. But the concern needs to happen each and every election before that's judges right. are elected or appointed. Thank you. So to continue the conversation, um, I'm gonna ask Judge Allen to get us started off on talking about her pathway to the bench. Well, you know, I was, an assistant county solicitor at the time. Um, and I had a wonderful supervisor. And this was back in 1980, I'm dating myself, but there were eight vacancies on the bench, which was a lot. And so my supervisor said to me, why don't you run? And I thought, run, this is something that's completely beyond my reach. I had no political connections, no political background to know anything. So I did not run, but a few years later, uh, when I was serving in juvenile court, I have to confess the judge made a decision that upset me so badly. I had a headache for two days because I thought that the decision displayed a tremendous amount of insensitivity and concern uh, for the children involved in the case. And I guess that's what kind of lit the fire under me that I can do this job. And so in 1987, I threw my hat into the ring. Um, I wasn't, I, I was beyond green when it comes to politics because I had absolutely no knowledge of anything. I didn't even realize that as a county employee, I was working around so many committee people. Mm -hmm. um, <laughs> But I, I soon learned the lay of the land. I ran for the endorsement that year. It wasn't as expensive as it is now. And I, I ran again in 1989. And I had managed to make um, political uh, connections over those years. My base began to grow. And in 1990, Governor Casey appointed me to a vacancy. Um, and of course, as you all know, when you're appointed uh, to a vacancy in a non-election year, you have to run in the next municipal election. So I remember uh, many people saying, well, she should rent her robe and not buy it uh, because we just elected a black woman uh, the last time that was Judge S Justice Cynthia Baldwin and we're just not going to do it again. <laughs> but um, I ran. I did win the endorsement. I, I was so, God was with me because I ended up with first ballot position. And um, I was certainly not the most well-financed camp campaign, never have been. I've never had TV commercials or anything like that. But I was able to uh, garner support from people all over the county and um, win. And Subsequently, as you've heard, I, I was elected to the Superior Court. Thank you. Judge Clark? So prior to um, running uh, or seeking a judicial office, I had worked uh, for 16 years as a prosecutor in the district attorney's office. I had a wonderful experience there. It was a job I love. I supervised what was then known as the Crimes Persons Unit that handled all the child abuse and sex assault cases. I try, had tried many, many homicide cases um, and I enjoyed it, but it became clear to me that I had reached my peak and I was not gonna break through that glass ceiling. Uh, I felt that I was passed over for positions that I thought I had the experience uh, and the seniority to get. And so in, <clears throat> at the end of, in 1998, uh, a good friend of mine who had been a colleague with me in the district attorney's office said, Kim, you need to quit this job and you need to run for judge. There will be six vacancies 
and it's easier. You don't need as many votes when you have, um, when there are more vacancies. And I didn't know, like Judge Allen, I was green. I didn't know that she was very politically connected. And she told me my family is very politically connected. And I promise that my entire family will support you in your efforts. And they did in a big way. She was absolutely true to her word. So on a leap of faith, I left, I quit my job and I began my journey. I think the benefit that I had was I did have a lot of high publicity cases. So I had a lot of cases and articles in the news media, television interviews, and people knew me. Uh, I actually called a press conference on Martin Luther King Day in 1999 to announce my resignation. And so it was a news story. Um, I also had the benefit of Judge Allen and Judge Baldwin and others who I who counseled me very well. Um, you know, I also reached back to Judge Johnson and Judge Watson and Judge mm -hmm. Little uh, and met with them as African Americans. Share with me your experiences in running for the mm -hmm. bench, and I received a lot of good advice from all of them. Um, Judge Allen. And Judge Baldwin helped me tremendously. And I have to say that. Um, I don't know that I would be where I am without their counsel and advice. So um, I had a good base. Um, I had law enforcement was solidly behind me when you're a prosecutor. And I guess you win lots of cases. Law enforcement backs you. So that was a help. My church family, my organizations were all helpful to me. But that was basically my path to the bench. Like Judge Allen, I got an appointment in March of 1999, uh, which then helped me to begin as sitting as a judge and people had mm -hmm. an opportunity on their own to see how I was. And I could ask people to, instead of elect Judge Clark, to keep Judge Clark. And mm -hmm. I think that helped. So that's my path to the bench. Thank you. Nicola? Yes. Could you talk about your, you know, your pathway as you're, as you're on your path? Well, I am trying to get there. So I am one of the candidates for the Court of Common Pleas of Allegheny County now. And I will echo what both judges said that, you know, there have been a couple of rough spots, but universally, for the most part, people have been so kind and giving, um, even people that I've just recently met. And for me, um, I am blessed to be very entrenched with the Women in the Law Division. And many years ago, we started a Pathways to the Bench program. So we have been involved with Ready to Run at Chatham University uh, um, Center. We have, we're very involved with Lizette McCormick, uh, and she's the, the, the director of uh, the Supreme Court Interbranch Commission on Racial, Gender, and ethnic fairness. That's a mouthful. But they have a wonderful uh, pamphlet that you should receive, have received in your materials called Creating a Diverse Bench in Pennsylvania. And Judge Clark was pictured in this as well. And so there are many resources and supports. And for by me being involved in helping other women and, and encouraging other women and knowing that we're hard on ourselves and we think we need to have all of the qualities where there are uh, numerous males running right now who have only been been out of law school seven years. I've been a lawyer for 25 years. That's how much we typically think we need. And so having all of this wonderful support with the Women in the Law Division and the Committee for Diversity and Inclusion, who's also done a lot of programming around these issues, that has been my pathway to feeling that I have a community, I have a village that, that now I don't feel like I'm doing this on my own. Thank you. Amanda? Like Nicola, I am certainly trying to get there still. Uh, I am still uh, an attorney, and I won't say just an attorney because you know it's still a huge responsibility, the oath that we take as lawyers um, to protect and defend the Constitution and to serve our clients. Um, but I think my journey, I would say my journey probably started back in law school. Um, I went to Northeastern University School of Law, which is a co-op uh, law school. We're required to do four co-ops before we graduate. And I remember looking for my first co-op. I wanted to work with a judge. And look, I wanted to work with a judge who, uh, who had different experience than I typically saw in the backgrounds of a lot of the judges. And this was certainly at the uh, federal level. And uh, there, the lack of diversity was 
blatant. Uh, many of the judges came from uh, U.S. attorneys' offices. They came from general corporate general counsel uh, offices, and I was looking for judges who had been, you know, ACLU lawyers, right? Uh, neighborhood legal services, public defenders, uh, people of color, and they were so few and far between. And I did work with um, a, an African American judge in uh, the U.S. District Court of New Jersey, Judge Greenaway. And uh, when I was looking for a clerkship after, after law school, I was looking for those same characteristics. And I found a judge, uh, African-American judge, state court level, who had been a pub, uh, who had done criminal defense work, you know, and I certainly welcomed the opportunity to work with him. Uh, but it was just striking to me that the lack of diversity on the bench um, meant that there would be fewer opportunities for people to be exposed to judges with different perspectives and different backgrounds. And so as a union lawyer, you know, the mo one of only 2,000 or so attorneys in the country who do the work that I do, you know, the lack of diversity, even in terms of the background for labor law is even more striking. And so do I sit around and complain that, oh, there aren't enough women on the bench, there aren't enough people of color on the bench, there aren't enough uh, labor lawyers on the bench, or do I, get my signatures on, on these petitions and run for, run for a judge. And so that's what I decided to do. And um, the only way to be, you know, to see the change sometimes is to certainly be a part of it. And that's the stance that I take. You have to be the change that you want to see and step out on faith. Um, I think all of the uh, prior speakers of judges and Nicola certainly um, can probably relate to that. You just step out and just go for it and see what happens. And in my first statewide race uh, with Superior Court back in 2019, um, I came three tenths of a point <laughs> short. That's how close I came. So the impossible can be possible. And I'm just the living testimony for that. And if nothing else, I hope that, you know, my journey certainly encourages other people to go out there and get their signatures and get on that ballot. Thank you. Amanda, I'm going to stay with you because one of the things that you brought up, as well as Judge Allen, was when considering to run for judge, one of the decisions a candidate has to make is, do you want to go with a county election or a statewide election? So I'm going to start with you and then go to Judge Allen. Could you talk about sort of some of the considerations that go into making that decision? Certainly. Um, well, for, for my background, um, my background is strong in appellate work. That has been the bulk of my career. Uh, writing briefs, reading those transcripts, you know, appealing to appealing decisions of administrative agencies. That is the core of what I do. And so I knew that if I if I wanted to serve, because this job really is about service, serving the public. And if it really is about service, then it's also about using whatever skills and tools you have to best serve the public. And for me, based on my experience, my legal experience, the best way I can serve is certainly at the appellate level, I believe, given the background uh, that I have. I've done appellate work all around, all over the country in federal, as well as uh, state courts, district courts, appellate courts. Um, and when you start with the steel workers, that's basically what you start doing immediately is you get a box with a transcript and <laughs> briefs and you're reading them and you're writing those briefs and going into court and doing those oral arguments. And um, I would also say that in terms of developing a base, uh, sometimes it may be, uh, I know it's different than doing a local a more local race here in Allegheny County because you're talking about people all across the state from different breadth backgrounds, different perspectives. Uh, but I think what you will find is that there are people all around the state who will support you, who will mm -hmm. welcome you with open arms, who will host events for you, um, who will work hard to help you to help you get elected. And that has been very humbling for me. I've been well received throughout this state. I will say that. Judge Allen, would you like to talk more about this consideration? Yes, you know, um, when I was a common police court judge and I would hear about judges running statewide and it just seemed like uh, such a, an overwhelming 
thing to me, but in many respects, running statewide uh, is easier sometimes than running locally uh, because you have people all over the state um, while you look to the state committee, uh, sometimes if you're seeking the party endorsement, you find that state committee people are not nearly as connected to the voters um, as local committee people. And um, very often the local committee people won't even honor the state committee endorsement. They like to make their own selections. And I've always taken the position that, you know, 300 and some people should not decide or make a decision for millions of people. Um, so I can honestly tell you that, you know, when I ran statewide, I ran without the party endorsement, but I found that people all over the state were very, very receptive to my candidacy. Uh, as a matter of fact, I came in first place in that primary election without the endorsement uh, because people, you, you find in politics, I find there are two kinds of people. You know, there are a lot of people who are there just because of what's in it for them. But then there are a lot of people who just want to see good people on the bench. And those people come in all colors and they come in uh, from, they come from all political persuasions. I can tell you that I ran, you know, very often people will say, well, how can you as a black person run in the center part of the state? That's where my strongest support came from, the center part of the state. Um, and, you know, people were just very receptive. I mean, they will circulate your petitions for nothing. You know, they will provide you with a place to stay in their homes, you know, so that you don't have to pay hotel expenses. And, um, I just met so many wonderful people across this state. And I can think of two examples of uh, two women that I know in Allegheny County who had virtually no chance of ever winning the endorsement and or winning an election here. And one of them was elected to the Commonwealth Court the first time she ran after numerous chance times of running for this for common police court. And the other one actually won the primary for Commonwealth Court, although she went on to lose the general. So running statewide is, is, is not as hard as you would think. If you live in a Western Pennsylvania, Allegheny County, Philadelphia, in any large metropolitan area, you definitely have a, um, an advantage uh, because that's where the population is. Being a woman, as we've seen, provides one with an advantage, at least in this season it does. And um, I encourage people, in fact, I, I, I have encouraged people to run statewide, so. I thought it was interesting, you had mentioned that you don't have to run for a countywide election before running for a statewide election. That's absolutely true. And in fact, when I ran uh, for Superior Court, uh, the top vote getter on the Democrat ticket never served as a judge. She had a lot of experience with her law firms, but she never served as a judge and she was highly rated by the Bar Association and did very well. I mean, it's not a requirement. We've had people on the, on the Supreme Court who never served as a judge before. Um, Justice Castile served as district attorney in, in Philadelphia. Um, you know, when I ran for Supreme Court, I had people say, well, uh, shouldn't you serve on the superior court first? Well, most well, I, at this time, most of the judges have served on the superior court or the Commonwealth Court, but there was a time when many judges went from common police court directly to the Supreme Court. And as I said before, there are people who've never served as a judge. We have people on the US Supreme Court who never served as a judge uh, before being appointed to that court. So it's not a requirement. Judge Allen, could you talk about the consideration when running about who and what is your base? You touched upon it. Yes. Um, when I ran in Allegheny uh, for Common Police Court, you know, we have to recognize the fact that Allegheny County 
I, I believe the black population is about 12 or 13%. And the state of Pennsylvania is pretty much the same. And so, you know, you need all kinds of people ac across the spectrum to support your candidacy. And one of the things I learned early on in my, in my, uh, along my journey is that not every black person is a friend or a supporter and not every white person is an enemy. And the same goes for Democrats and Republicans because it's very, very, you know, I don't believe you can win a statewide election with, through just one party. You know, I don't believe that I would have won the general election for superior court had I not had a number of Democrats cross over to vote for me as a registered Republican. And um, you, need, you need everyone. And I find that people are pretty much the same. They're looking for people or for candidates that they can relate to, uh, that they can talk to, uh, people who share their concerns about society, who share some of their family concerns, um, people who are sensitive. And this is aside from people who are competent and knowledgeable about what it takes to be a good judge. They're looking for people who are going to be fair, who are not going to uh, be a respecter of persons, you know, who are not going to treat politically connected or wealthy people better. And um, that's across the board. And I've traveled all over the state. Um, and I think regardless of whether you're a Democrat or a Republican, there are, once you leave Allegheny County and Philadelphia and maybe some of the a few counties in the center part of the state or Erie, you, you don't see people who look like you. I mean, that's, that's basically it. And, um, but I saw and met a lot of people who shared my values. Um, and who share and who were just looking for good people to put on the bench. And many of those people are my friends to this day. Judge Clark, you, you briefly touched upon um, who made up your base. You touched upon family, friends, neighbor, your neighborhood. Would you like to talk about that? Sure, so um, I just wanna go back. I think Judge Allen mentioned that when she was um, running, she did not get the endorsement. Um, I did not get the endorsement from the Democratic Party uh, when I ran. I sought the endorsement, but I did get the endorsement of pretty much every other group that endorses. I had the endorsement of labor. I had the endorsement uh, of law enforcement. Um, I had the endorsement from the Federation of Teachers, um, but I also had a lot of other um, uh, friends and family and community support. I think, as I stated, my career as a prosecutor helped because when I announced that I was running, much to my surprise, uh, victims on cases that I had uh, called and wanted to help, wanted signs, wanted to do things, even people who had served on juries, which really surprised me. I had you know, you remember your victims and witnesses perhaps, but you don't really necessarily remember the people that actually served on a jury. But when you think about it, that's probably a once in a lifetime thing for most people to serve on a jury if they mm -hmm. are privileged enough to do it. And they remember everything about the, that case. So my mm -hmm. point is this, is that I think how you engage and treat people in the course of your life will mm -hmm has a direct impact upon who will support you in your desire to run for judge or any other political office. Um, I didn't have a lot of money. I did no commercials. I couldn't afford to do that. Um, so I had a real grassroots campaign, but um, you, everyone is connected to someone. Some people have large families. Some people are involved in sororities and fraternities and other organizations. Some people serve on boards, 
uh, you know, belong to a church, a synagogue, a temple, a mosque, or some religious uh, connection where people will support them. Um, and you have to really dig down and think about who is it that's going to help me um, because you can't do it by yourself. I'm, I'm a firm believer in life. No one is a self-made anything that think that does not exist. They need to just get rid of the word self-made that phrase um, because it's just not true. Um, but, and I do agree with judge Allen, you have to look beyond sort of, if you want to call it your own comfort zone or people that look like you, because you know, there are many people out there that are just as interested in diversity as I am, but they don't look like me. And mm -hmm. some of you who may have heard me say in, in previous um, presentations that in terms of mentors, if we look to only people who look like us to be our mentors, we will miss something. Uh, some of the people that have given me the best advice and mentored me in a wonderful way and that I think are responsible for me, for me in the, in where I am are people that don't look like me. There are white men that have your best interests at heart. And so if you limit yourself, uh, you will be missing something. And mm -hmm. I think you cannot be successful if you just isolate yourself for, for whoever looks like you. So, you know, I think for me, it was a grueling experience, but it was a good experience. It was eye opening. Uh, like Judge Allen, um, uh, I made some lasting relationships. Um, I was, it really was an eye opener as to the process. And uh, so uh, I think that, um, you know, each person has to decide for himself or herself what their base or is. Part of my base was, I have to say, as, as a prosecutor, um, uh, when uh, I went out into the area, I had the Mon Valley um, as, a, as an area prosecutor. And then when I was appointed to the bench, for whatever reason, uh, in my dependency cases, I had the Mon Valley. And so I spent a lot of time in McKeesport and other parts of the Mon Valley to the point where a lot of people actually thought I was from the Mon Valley, um, but that turned out to be a huge support. There was a huge political network in the Mon Valley uh, mm -hmm. area of Allegheny County. And I got a lot of support from those folks in Mon Valley because they knew me and they knew me as a prosecutor. They knew me as a judge. I had a lot of friends that lived in that area. So, you know, certain areas of the city or county could be part of your base, but it's for each of you to decide. So continuing with the, you know, your base and building your base, uh, we're gonna move into campaign and visibility. And with COVID, it's a little bit of a different atmosphere. Nicola, would you like to talk about sort of what you're experiencing or doing during the time of COVID and, and running for, for judge? That's an excellent question. So typically, if we were not in COVID, the candidates would be uh, every night running from one meeting to the other. And one meeting could be on one end in the Alakiski Valley, and then later on, you need to go all the way out to the Mon Valley. Sometimes surrogates are used. But now that we're in the times of COVID, a lot of these meetings are being held uh, via Zoom. Uh, it's probably helpful for us to sit in our house and just flip from Zoom meeting to the other, but it is absolutely draining uh, to sit in front of the computer screen, uh, especially if you're working like Amanda and I are. We're both still practicing attorneys while we're campaigning. Um, so doing all those Zoom meetings are important. Um, you can uh, you can actually get a lot of information out on social media. And that's been very, uh, I think, helpful for my campaign. We are on every platform. We're working on TikTok. My teenage daughter would like to get us on TikTok. But other than that, we're on every platform. Um, and we, one thing that we leveraged is uh, I did not seek the Democratic endorsement. Uh, about 18 people did for nine slots and paid $8,000 each. Uh, and if you do the math, I think it was about $144,000. So, you know, for other reasons as well, we did not think there was a good cost benefit analysis. So we put out a press release. It was picked up by a reporter, Chris Potter. He tweeted and then did an article uh, uh, for WESA and then also did an interview for me. And I've been getting a lot of podcast requests. I would say at least once a week, I've been on a podcast. So leveraging what you have that we have to work with in the era of COVID and social media 
are some things that I would recommend. Amanda, would you like to add anything? Uh, certainly, and uh, you know, the, I call it the COVID campaign is certainly different from the way I campaigned previously. Uh, you know, we have 67 counties here in Pennsylvania, and I reached uh, 63 of them and put 40,000 miles on a vehicle. And a lot of that was uh, meeting people where they were, talking with them, spending time with them, which is absolutely wonderful. I enjoy that part of a campaign thoroughly. But now here we are, and I am confined, as I say, to this box, right? <laughs> meeting after meeting each night uh, with different commi uh, Democratic committee people around the state and different organizations around the state as well. This is what we have to, uh, this is what we have to do to get our names out and to let people know about our qualifications and our temperament and all of the, all those other qualities that you want in, in a judge. And um, social media is certainly going to be very important. Uh, with Facebook and Twitter and Instagram. Uh, I'm not sure about TikTok just yet. I'm sure <laughs> my kids will love that idea. <laughs> but you know, we have to be creative and utilize whatever resources are available to us. And that would be a podcast, like Nicola was talking about. Also interviews with newspapers or um, maybe people who have uh, YouTube channels or something like that. Um, Facebook live events, uh, panels that are being done by different organizations around, at least for me, around the state are some of the things that, a lot of the things that I'm doing now, as opposed to getting in that car and meeting people where they are. Mm -hmm. I just wanted to add one thing about TikTok. Um, Senator Warnack and I forgot the other person who ran, they ran together. They had a really good TikTok that um, my daughter showed me. So it's been, it, it is being utilized now in campaigns. Oh, I'm sure. Awesome. <laughs> Thank you for that, Regina. Oh, thinking about the senators in Georgia. Yeah, <laughs> they, it was well done. It was two speeches weaved together. Uh, and you know, it's a very limited time frame, and there's a lot of cutting away, but it was done professionally. And it's it may not get all of your target audience, but you may get some people who are 18 or and you <laughs> tell their parents, vote for this person, they're cool, uh, or whatever it is that they would say. They probably wouldn't call it cool. <laughs> Let me, if I could, if I could add one more thing, you know, not only are we campaigning during the time of COVID, but we're also campaigning <laughs> at a time when we have mail-in ballots as opposed sure. to strictly in-person voting. And the mail and the mail-in ballots will be printed and hitting people in their homes uh, sometime during the first week of April. So we're dealing also <laughs> with a bifurcated kind of election where we're mm -hmm. trying to reach people where they are. So we touch them before they uh, vote on those mail-in ballots. And then we're also trying to reach those who vote in person. And the uh, strategy is a little <laughs> different for both because you, know, you want to try to touch people more than once uh, before they vote with that mail-in ballot. And so there's going to be a lot of mail into homes directly as well. And, and in addition to the mail text, there's a lot of programs that will send out these texts or have your volunteers text people. So a lot of targeted um, touches based on the fact that we want to touch the voters right when those uh, mail, -in mail in ballots hit their box. So trying to get there as close as possible is key. That was a great point, Amanda. So Judge Allen, you had talked about um, when you're running, when to start running and to never stop running for judge. Would you like to talk about that? Well, yes. Um, as I told you before, I started my journey in 1987 and um, I did not win the party endorsement. And at that time I, I made a decision to not run um, in the primary. However, I never stopped running. I attended every political event um, that, that took place during that campaign, even though I was not one of the candidates. Um, I attended all the picnics in the summertime that they used to have and all the Christmas parties. And um, I kept my face in the game. In 1989, I ran again for the party endorsement and I came close, but I, but I did not win but I never stopped campaigning. You know, I didn't, sometimes people will wait until 
uh, the fall or you know the endorsement period to pick up their campaign and do nothing in between. I did not, I didn't do that. I just kept running, kept campaigning, kept attending the events. And I think that went a long way uh, when it came time for the governor to make that appointment, one of those appointments in 1990. And so um, I can't tell people enough. I mean, I didn't have the benefit of the, having the base that say Kim had going into it. So I had to just gradually build that base uh, over a series, a number of years. And then when I was appointed to the bench, I remember asking the president, Judge, Judge Zavarella at the time, I said, you're not going to put me in criminal court, are you? Because that's the last place I, that's the place I never practiced. And it's the last place I wanted to sit. But it turned out to be the absolute best place to run from because I ended up with this really high profile case where Judge Clark was the prosecutor. And um, I mean, it really put my name out there, you know, on the front page. And so many people who, who, who said they wouldn't support me uh, came to my, you know, came into my camp because they liked the way I handled that. And the criminal court turned out to be the best place to run from because it is the court where you're going to get the most high profile cases, the most publicity. So thank you, Judge Clark. <laughs> and I know you remember what case I'm talking I about. I remember, <laughs> she was excellent. But it's funny because the, the defense lawyer was Kevin Sazanowski, who was also a judge too. So, you know, so that was the that was the interesting part about it. All three of us uh, are on the bench. So, so we've touched upon it already, but let's move into endorsements and specifically into the wait your turn conversation. Um, I think everybody on the panel probably has a story, but. Um, Nicola, do you want to start us off? I would love to. And the way I knew there was a wait your turn conversation was because Judge Clark previously uh, has, has done numerous roundtables for us and Judge Allen has too uh, about uh, your pathway to the bench. And she told us in a woman of color pathway to the bench that, you know, we should not wait, feel like we have to wait our turn. And actually there are some candidates now in some of their applications, they're saying how they're waiting their turn. So what they will say is, well, I ran last cycle, but I was very kind and I stepped aside and I'm waiting my turn. A lot of that, a lot of that request to wait your turn happens to the women and the people of color. And I actually had a, a very vivid, wait your turn moment where when my um, my campaign gave me a list of politicians to call in my call time, I you you carve out time every week that you dedicate to, to calling people for your campaign. So uh, I called this one politician when we finally, he wanted an in-person meeting. Now that we're in COVID, that was not uh, commonplace. So uh, I went to the meeting mm -hmm. and it was the conversation that he has a great idea for me. And his great idea is that I should wait four years. And in four years, if I get to be appointed to this wonderful spot that he think I, I thinks I can get appointed to, then I can make a name for myself. Then I will be ready. I am close to 50. I have been practicing 25 years. I have practiced in every single division. I have been a leader in this bar and community. So I don't know when it's gonna be my turn if it's not now. So that's how I feel about the wait your turn. I have a, a, a story to share. Um, when I was running in 1991 for Common Pleas Court, um, as a sitting judge uh, with the highest recommendations from the Bar Association, everyone who had come in ahead of me in the endorsement in 1989 was on the bench. And I remember going to the Southern part of the county. I think Judge Clark, you probably know what I'm referring to. And had people ask me, well, if you don't win the endorsement, um, what, are you going to run? And, you know, of course they expect you to say no. Mm -hmm. And so I told them, of course I'm going to run. Mm -hmm. And I said, you know, I'm a sitting judge. Um, I stepped out of the race the last time 
and everyone who came in ahead of me um, is on the bench. So if you're not going to endorse me now, when are you ever going to endorse me? And if you're not going to endorse me now, why? <laughs> and I got eight votes out of 33 votes that night. <laughs> but a number of people approached me, a number of chairmen approached me during the next period and said, you know, I couldn't vote for you that night for whatever reason, um, but we're going to support you. And I just say, this, there is a double standard when it comes to women. And I believe especially black women. And if I had waited my turn, so to speak, I probably would still be waiting. Mm -hmm. Or I, you know, I would have maybe not been able to serve uh, any length of time on the bench. Uh, you have to decide when is your term and when is your, when is your time. You can't allow other people to make that decision for you. So I would say, yes, we've all had that, that uh, wait your turn moment um, from people in the party. Uh, when I left the DA's office and I wanted to extend a personal farewell to Steve Zappala, who was the DA at the time, um, he met with me. And he basically told me I needed to reconsider my decision to run. It wasn't my turn. I hadn't been out there. There were mm -hmm. other strong candidates, other strong black candidates. That's the other thing. You could, there can only be one of us. You know, right. there could be nine openings and six white men can run and three and two white women can run, but only one black person, male or female, <laughs> mm -hmm. is allowed to run and prevail. I mean, that's it. That's all you get. And so I quit my job to run. So when I was asked that question, if you don't get the endorsement, will you drop out? My answer was, I quit my job to run. Mm -hmm. I am mm -hmm. in this as long as I can. Obviously, if I don't prevail in the primary, I'm out. But right now I'm in to win and I'm in as long as I need to be in. So I think Judge Allen's right. You have to decide that for yourself. For some people, Maybe the road to go is to seek the endorsement and do not run against the endorsement. I can't say that that's that I can't tell you not to do that. I can say I chose not to do that, um, even though, um, you know, my father was a strong Democrat in Allegheny County in his lifetime. I still chose to run without that endorsement because I put everything on the line to run. As I said, I stepped out on that leap of faith and people were behind me and supporting me and I didn't wanna let them down either. Mm -hmm. So um, I chose to run without the endorsement. I chose to ignore the advice that it's mm -hmm. not your turn yet. And there are other people who have been out there longer and you need to wait a little bit longer, but they never tell you how long that is for sure. Well, they did tell Nicole a four yeah, year. Yeah, he gave so me a four year period. But <laughs> It's interesting because right now I'm reading President Obama's uh, book, A Promised Land, and he describes a conversation, a meeting he had with Senator Harry Reid, who had called him to his office mm -hmm. and was encouraging him to run. And he said, well, maybe it's not my time yet. I don't, maybe I need to have more experience. And he said, you're not going to be any more ready to serve as president four years from now or six years from now. Sometimes you have to do it when the timing is right. The time sometimes selects you. And so you can't necessarily wait for it's your turn because right now for this year, this year, there are nine openings. That's not going to happen again for a while, if ever. So for some people, whether it's their turn or not, or whether somebody tells them it's their turn, the time has selected them and it is their turn. So you have to look at a whole lot of things uh, when you're making that decision. I wanna, I wanna say um, on a state level, I, I was faced with the uh, same thing. Uh, people felt that, um, and, and I was the oldest candidate in the race, you know, on, on the Republican and certainly the, by far the most experienced candidate and so when people would ask me if I was going to drop out if I didn't get the endorsement, my response was, I want to sit on the Superior Court. And the only way that can happen is if I run. Mm -hmm. And I'm not going to drop, I'm not going to get out of the race 
un unless the voters put me out of the race. And, you know, I don't believe, you know, there are 10 million people in, in Pennsylvania. I don't know how many million voters there are, but I know there are millions. And I just don't believe that three or 400 people should decide, you know, who, who the judges are. So I, I made it very clear that I'll get out when the voters put me out. That's the only way. And, but everyone has to make that decision for themselves. Regina, um, if I could just add, uh, yes. you know, like I said, I believe that this is this job is about service, right? Mm -hmm. And for me as a person of color, the sense of urgency that I have about justice and fairness cannot mm -hmm. wait for a turn. We're living at a time when people are complaining about bias in our judicial system. We are living at a time when there are people literally crying in the streets, asking if justice is accessible or attainable for people who look like them, who happen to also be people who look like me. And we have only one out of 31 appellate judges here in Pennsylvania being mm -hmm. a person of color. I have such a sense of urgency about it that we cannot talk about waiting a turn. We have lives on the line. And if you're telling me that other lives don't matter as much as some other lives, we can have that conversation too, if we want to, right? About whether all lives matter or black lives matter. But there is such a sense of urgency about justice and the need to have different perspective and different voices elevated when we're talking about justice and fairness. The whole wait your turn uh, conversation is not something that if, if someone wanted to have it with me, I haven't heard it. <laughs> That's all I can tell you. I haven't even heard it because I am focused. I have children that I have to think about, but you know, we, there's too much to do and the work is too important. I have one other thing to add. Uh, I love that Amanda just added in the statistic that we only have one black woman, uh, Judge Nichols, who's running for the Supreme Court. She's sitting on the Superior Court. She was a, a court of common pleas judge. I believe it's in Philadelphia. Uh, mm -hmm. Judge Clark is saying that's correct. Um, she, dropped. And, she did drop, I'm sorry. Oh, okay, okay. That she is. dropped, she's not running anymore? No, she dropped. Uh, I did not year. know that, okay. Well, right. she's still on the Superior Court. Yes. Um, and, and hopefully we will get her on the Supreme Court. However, I wanted to note the history of Allegheny County, which dates back very, very long, many hundreds of years, mm -hmm. uh, that we have only had four black female judges. Two of them are sitting with us today. Um, and mm -hmm. that currently we only have fat four black uh, judges and um, we, you know, we're getting to the point where those judges who have been wonderful servant leaders may need, they deserve to retire, especially after handling COVID. <laughs> I'm going not in the not too distant future. So that's why we really need, we, right. we need to have representation because it's not my goal to die on the bench. Right. Um, and so, right. And I don't know that everyone knows the lay of the land. So we, we want to, to let you know, uh, you know, and just to kind of um, uh, dovetail with uh, Amanda's uh, very passionate plea that time is of the essence and our country showed that time is of the essence. And so we need to respond. Judge Allen, I thought you said something that was very interesting that, you know, because everyone on the panel has different endorsement stories, mm -hmm. whether they sought it or not. And you said that, you know, endorsements don't replace people to people connections. Absolutely. I mean, one, one thing uh, I, I remember Judge Baldwin saying, and I've never forgotten it. She said, you uh, have to count your votes one person one vote at a time, uh, because I found that particularly on the county level and to some extent on the state level, the tendency is to believe that, well, if I can get the support of this leader or this chairman, um, then you know I can get that committee. And it doesn't work that way. When people go into the voting booth, they are there alone. And if you have made that connection or somehow impressed that person, that, per that person is going to vote for you. And the, the tendency to believe that, uh, you know, you, you can't just win an election with chiefs. You need workers. You need people who are going to get out there and do the work and, and reach the people. Uh, you need committee people 
who are going to go door to door, who know their constituents and are going to push your campaign. And a lot of times, particularly when you're talking about state committee people, they don't have that, that kind of uh, um, connection with the voters. And so I believe that there's, there's no substitution for a grassroots campaign. Just like Judge Clark, I've never had money. Um, when I ran against the party uh, for Superior Court, I was told that there was no way I was going to win unless I had at least $600,000. I didn't have $6,000, I, don't, I, don't, I didn't have any money. And uh, I've never had TV commercials, never able to do a mass mailing, um, which were considered at the time the best, most effective ways to campaign. Um, social media was not what it is now. And social media is wonderful because it's not as expensive but um, you have to get out there and meet the people and you have to be creative. I mean, you have to, there were people who would just do mass emails and have their friends email everyone they knew and have their friends that email everyone they knew. There were postcards, all kinds of things like that. You really have to be creative and, and when it comes to finances and raising money, but you never um, seek you know, a person, a leader, a chairman controls one vote, mm -hmm. is or her own. Mm -hmm. That's the way you have to look at things and you have to touch the people. I remember running for common police court and in those days you would spend, you know, every night you had to go six or seven places and there was no rhyme or reason. You'd go from McKeesport to Coriopolis I learned to drive real fast. I had to break <laughs> myself of the habit of driving fast. Um, but I would see people standing around waiting for the chairman to introduce them to the crowd before they would move on. And I never felt I had that luxury. I would go into my first place, go from table to table, introduce myself to everyone um, and, and then move on to the next place. And it didn't matter to me whether the chairman introduced me or not. I mean, it was nice, but that, that was something that I found was not the most effective way to campaign. Mm -hmm. um, that you have to go into a room. I learned to work the room, to go to every table, to go to every person, shake their hand. Hi, I'm you know, Cheryl Allen, so on and so forth and then move on to the next place. And that way I could make all six places. Um, I do remember being stopped by the police <laughs> once for speeding. I, I think because I was a judge, they, they showed me some mercy. But <laughs> um, driving all over this county, this is a big county. I used to joke about how nice it would be to have a helicopter. <laughs> that would be for the state too. <laughs> But, but you know, going from place to place, you mm -hmm. never change your message. Absolutely. That's absolutely true. Um, you have to be consistent. You know, people are challenged more today than they were in 1991 with regard to their personal stand on, on issues, um, whether you answer or whether you give you know, just tell the person that you're going to uphold the law, which a lot of people are not going to be satisfied with these days. But, you know, you have to be consistent. You take your stand and you're never going to please everyone, you know, but you have to be true to yourself and be consistent. Because more than anything else, I mean, I remember once campaigning in Philadelphia, um, attending a forum by a group of a, a number of progressive groups. And this woman who was organizing it literally begged me to come. And I went and I was the only Republican candidate there. And so when they started asking questions, I answered very honestly. And at the end, you know, she told me, she says, people really liked you because they respected your honesty. Even if they didn't agree with your position. They respected your sincerity. 
your sincerity and your honesty. And that's what people are looking for. And the bottom line is you, as a judge, you're not just there to be judged for Democrats or Republicans or independents or liberals or conservatives for men or women. So all of that has to go behind. The issue is, Mm -hmm. are you going to be able to, you know, be just and fair? Are you going to listen to what people have to say and base your decisions upon the law and the facts of the case? Are you right. going to uphold the Constitution of the United States of Pen- of the United States of America and the Commonwealth right. of Pennsylvania? And are you going to treat people with dignity and respect? And that's really it. You know, you're the judge. You're a judge. Whatever court you serve on, you serve all of the citizens, all of those constituents. Right. Whether it's in Allegheny County, or if you're a magisterial district judge in your in your district or in the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania, if you serve on an appellate court, you work for everybody, every taxpayer who falls into that category. And so that's the way it is. And that's the message that you need to consistently convey to the voting public, that this is who I am and I work for everybody, not just for one group. We we are out of like, so we've got, you're two minutes over, um, but we did have a question in the chat. If you, if we have a moment to answer it really quickly, I don't know if everyone's with everyone's schedule is like, um, it was, how do you recommend a, to a lay person or I'm sorry, how do you recommend a lay person consider and analyze credentials of those running for office? What should we be asking? And the first, well, one of the places I would say is the Allegheny County Bar Association uh, ratings from our Judiciary Committee, which will be published, I think, in the month of March. Yeah, it'll be published right before the deadline for candidates to withdraw. Um, But candidates are putting that information out themselves. The Bar Association will not necessarily confirm. So that deadline, um, I'll have to look at that and then I'll let you know. Um, But I... Did you have something else to add? Because I wanted to say something really quickly about what uh, was just said. First of all, there are rules of ethics that gu- that guide us in all of this, mm-hmm. and I probably should have included it in the materials because uh, there's a nice FAQ that people can look at, and Judge Bush has done a presentation on this. Then the mm-hmm. other thing is to Judge Clark's point about being uh, nonpartisan and working for all the citizens. Mm-hmm. A lot of candidates. Oh. Allegheny County will cross file. And so you can try to be on both the Democrat and Republican ballot. So those are some things we're not going to be able to get into every single detail, but just so people who don't know the process have additional context. Mm-hmm. And I do recommend trying, I mean, making every effort to get on both ballots. I think it's very difficult to win. Um, just with one ballot, you, you, you need everyone and um, and I find that the Republicans I mean generally unless they are running a slate of candidates themselves which I don't know if they are because it is very difficult in Allegheny County um, to be elected strictly as a Republican because of the voter registration advantage Um, but you know they want to know who the judges are also the last day to withdraw uh, is March 24th. And um, so that will give everybody a sense of when, and that's a part of, that's on the, on the web, on the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania Department of State Bureau of Elections and mm-hmm. Notice website. And with respect to finding out who the candidates are, a lot of uh, grassroots groups like uh, Order of the Phoenix and Indivisible Forest Hills have been doing forums. And the North uh, Northern Regional Democratic Committee also did a forum. And if you go to their websites, there's a lot of videos where you can hear uh, the, the candidates see their de- demeanors. Uh, Amanda and I last night participated in the Coriopolis NAACP forum. And what we have been telling people is don't just look at at what people are saying. People are saying, I am passionate about criminal justice. I want cash bail reform. Look at their deeds. What have people done in their career? Uh, you know, and talk to people who know them. We have a very close legal community. 
Pittsburgh is like a wonderfully big, small town. Talk to people, do your own research, and don't just uh, listen to people saying, uh, you know, I'm wonderful and I've done everything. And the Bar Association Judiciary Committee is very thorough. So I would echo what uh, Regina said as well. And I would say with social media, just or just Googling with the internet, you know, which that was a lot of that was not available when I ran, but it's easy to find out at least some basic things. You can find out if lawyers have been disciplined. Uh, you can find out a number of things with their true work experiences. For those who have are appointed and running, go observe court. <laughs> That's a good way to see, see how they're doing, you know, you know, ask somebody that may know them and just think about, is this somebody that I would want um, to mm -hmm. preside over a, my case or the case of a loved one? I mean, you can be the most brilliant person. You can have been, have been a brilliant trial lawyer. Um, but if you ask me personally, the characteristic that I think is most important for people sitting on the bench, especially at the trial court level, it is temperament. That's mm -hmm. number one, good judicial temperament, the ability to treat people with dignity and respect and to have a respectful process because in many cases, it's really not about the result, it's how you get there. It's the process about how we reach our decisions and do people understand it. And the second thing I think that's important is having a strong work ethic, temperament mm -hmm. and strong work ethic. Those are my top two. Then we have the other stuff, but those are the top two. So if you have some hot shot, bad tempered, mm -hmm. brilliant trial lawyer, they're probably not going to make the best trial judge because of temperament. So that's and my he, piece he of, had an oh, example of that last year. Um, and that person stepped down. So yes. that's what comes to my mind. Mm -hmm. so, so we are seven minutes over our yeah. time. I knew we were going to go over and this conversation is another hour. So <laughs> thank you everyone, thank you to our panelists today. And thank you for everyone for joining us. Hope you have a wonderful <laughs> afternoon and a wonderful weekend. Thank Bye. Stay safe, everyone. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.